process of a chance to analyze the data and find out and identify where where people are having the biggest problems with uh, uh, collecting data reliably and consistently and we'll come back with you with support to help improve make improvements in that, uh, in, that. Um, in terms of making adjustments there are some critical very high priority adjustments that but not very many, so I don't want to be in too energy. That can be made uh, uh, about one, once a year with this system, and then the entire system is revised approximately every three years. It's not too soon, though, to start keeping track of what kind of changes that we would all like to see in the system to make it more useful to you. So thinking in terms of measures that are not there, that, that should be there, for example, or uh, measures that are not asked in a way that are giving us the kinds of information that we're looking for. So um, once we get past the initial hurdles of actually you know, succeeding in getting data submitted, we can start thinking more expansively about what we'd like the system to look like in the years to come. Um, all right, so we're going to go on to making better use of this data. Um, and I just want to hold up a few things to look forward to. There are uh, online data dashboards that are going to be developed. We hope that, that will be a substantial improvement over the existing systems called Mayo of Rhymus. Um, and it will allow grantees to have access to their own data that they submit and be able to make strategic comparisons at the state and national levels. Um, there will also be a public component to, to, this, uh, to this dashboard system. Um, we're starting a data brief series based on Rhymus data. Uh, so and are planning initially to do some basic descriptive briefs, one on uh, PCP and one on TLPs for public consumption, um, but in ways that I, I hope will be useful to you um, in, in, in your work. Um, we will also be doing, um, uh, we've already mentioned the, the data going into the, to the AHAR and report to Congress. And uh, we're also, in, in fact, we're using the 2014 earlier data to do research to support um, the, uh, the federal uh, the goal to end youth homelessness by 2020. There's a group that's uh, been tasked, an interdepartmental group has been tasked to come up with performance measures, and these include measures using the right data. So we hope in all these ways to be able to, to uh, to create products from the data that will allow us to produce better, to inform policy and to uh, and to run our programs more effectively. Hmm. All right, and now um, that's what we plan to do with the RIMAS data, but you all also have access to your own HMIS systems uh, with data from the entire entirety of the uh, continuum of care. And, uh, and Deborah, are you going to start? Or I mean, I'm sorry, Karen, are you going to start? Yeah. Sorry. Since we're short on time, let me find the slides. Since we're short on time, I had a couple of slides that look at system wide COC level data. And this is from Cincinnati. Um, I asked Michelle to pull some data again that was system wide, just giving you an idea of what you can. Can, what you can use your HMIS data for, what your community can use it for. Um, so this gives you an idea of youth households, how many unduplicated youth are in certain households, um, youth age by household type. Um, most importantly, in my opinion, you know, special needs of your youth so that you can make sure that you, know, you have the services that your youth need in your communities. Um, and you know, many of you may be sitting here thinking, well, I, I already know all this stuff. I don't you know, why did I need HMIS to tell me all this? I know. Um, I know that my kids have mental health issues and have substance abuse problems. Um, and, that, and of course you know, because you, you work with them every day. But the numbers really give you the power. Um, as many of you have had to go before funding boards or you know, local boards to try to get money or write grants or however you advocate to get more services for your youth, you know that you know, anecdotes and an kind of anecdotal stories only get you so far. So the data um, and the numbers are really going to give you the power 
um, to, to take it up a level and be able to advocate even more for your kids and for more money or for more services or more collaboration between your local and state agencies or whatever you need to be able to provide more services and, you know, for your kids. So the final couple slides I'm going to ask Michelle to go through. This is Cincinnati's data and this is looking at a very specific subset of kids who are in her system that, um, that deal with the foster care system. So I feel like I need to take some responsibility for having you all have to enter this data into HMIS. I think it was about five years ago that Debbie Powell and I sat across the table and um, I, you guys were doing Neorimus and I was doing HMIS and we were fussing about which was the better system. Wasn't that right, Debbie? <laughs> um, and trying to integrate those systems so that they could talk together and they couldn't. Um, and then the more we looked at it, and, and the deeper uh, we went into the data, the more we realized that the data we had in Neil Rivas wasn't as good as we wanted it to be, and that we really needed to start getting some unduplicated numbers across um, communities about homelessness and unduplicated numbers across the nation about homelessness, and so that's what we're trying to do. Um, these guys have worked really, really, really hard, and I, I am the non-fed here, <laughs> And I am the person that normally sits in your seat and advocates probably against these guys <laughs> for what I want. <laughs> um, but I need to tell you that they have, they have really, really, really tried. And it has been a stress and an effort to get two totally different systems to learn to listen to each other and understand the words that we use. So I know somebody said to me, today that they couldn't understand some of the words that were on the um, uh, webinar that you guys just had. And, and that's where we've been the whole time. You know, we're, we're sometimes talking a different language. If you haven't noticed in the COC application, in your COC, in your communities, um, from all the stuff you've heard up here, youth homelessness is the hot topic of the year. You guys have made it. You've made a huge impact on the, on the nation um, for people looking at what's going on with youth homelessness. And this is one of the ways we're gonna count it and get to, try to get to the end of it, right? Is to be able to figure out what's happening. So in my community, just, I'm from Cincinnati, I'm on the HMIS Dan Lab in Cincinnati, and all of our providers have um, inputted data into HMIS since 2004, including my ride providers. Um, so we've been we've been at this a long time and have been able to pull together some really rich data. But what we can do in a local community is something that you probably wanted to do but never could do with your neo rhymes system. When my providers wanted to know how, more about how many homeless people were in foster care. We added a field in our system to ask everybody that's homeless, have you ever been in foster care? So that we could look at really strong um, preventative stuff around it. And so all you're seeing here is that in 2014, um, there were between, uh, there were 2,400 kids that were between um, 18 and 25 uh, adults young adults, right, that were between 18 and 25. Um, and of those 409 of them identified as, uh, self-identified as uh, having been in foster care, uh, formerly wards of the, of the state. Um, they showed us where they lived then during the year because we could pull that data behind them. And so this is showing you how many intakes those 409 kids had throughout the course of a year in all these different kind of projects. So you're seeing them coming and going out of shelters and off the street and um, some of them finally making it to permanent housing, but some of them needing emergency assistance like food or um, clothing from a food pantry. You're, some of them getting on the health care for the homeless van. You're just seeing them all over the place. Um, and you're seeing that some of them really lasted and 
um, foster care a long time. 31% of them were in foster care more than five years. So um, we know, they told us how long they've been there and what was going on. Unlike our regular um, uh, youth data, the kids that were in foster care were not primarily um, uh, gay kids. They were uh, primarily heterosexual kids, um, which surprised us. We, we really thought we'd see um, a different, different trend for that. But we also saw that um, uh, 3% of them showed a um, connection to the juvenile justice system at the point that they entered, so they went from foster care to juvenile justice, lovely. And 7.5 um, of them um, had exited their project into a jail. So we're seeing you know, what's happening to these kids the whole time. Um, we're all, we also know how many people are chronically homeless in our community, and to our surprise, out of those 409 youth, 112 of them were um, chronically homeless. That's a, that's a long time for a person that, that's a large amount for a person that age to be chronically homeless. And to my personal chagrin, because it absolutely drives me crazy that the foster care system can let our kids out without getting them Medicare, or Medicaid, and without connecting them to that, 44% of them had nothing when they were released from the system. So you know that as well as I know that. What does that information do? That information brought our community together with 30 different kinds of providers um, to work with ACYF on a, um, ending or preventing homelessness among um, foster care kids. But it's because we had the data and we knew we could track it and we knew what was going on that we were able to present a good case and get that kind of a grant and that kind of support. So I encourage you to not just think about the data that you're sending to them, but the data and how you can use it yourself now, and how you can integrate the rest of your community to grab great data that you know is going to make a difference. Um, because when I started this gig 30 years ago and started working on homelessness, People would say things like, there's 10,000 homeless people in your community, or 25,000 homeless people in your community, and, you know, literally they were pulling that number out of somewhere, uh, you know where? I now know, I know exactly how many people are homeless in Cincinnati. I know the names of every one of those people that are homeless. And in the think tanks that I do every year with homeless folks, they have said to me repeatedly that the way out of homelessness is for somebody to know your name and for that somebody to know their stuff. One of the things HMIS does is to help you know their name and to connect you stronger with that kid to help you get them through the process because you do know your stuff. You do know where to, how to get them out of homelessness. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. So we, we did run a little late starting, but we did want to take a couple of minutes to allow for questions. I, I do want to remind folks that we have two sessions tomorrow, one uh, initially with the AIR representatives, and then a second session 10.30, which is a follow-up to this. Both will be in this room. You also have some individual TA consultation that there's a sign-up over by the registration. But for uh, those who want to ask questions, we don't want to give you a couple of minutes. And so the request is that you state your name and the organization that you're with. And uh, there should be some roving mics right here in the front uh, for someone who would like to ask a question. Good afternoon. My name is Cindy Williams and I'm with Loving Arms, Inc. in Baltimore, Maryland. My question is, um, I'm going to go back to what you talked about with TLP. 
Um, I wanted to find out when is the next announcement, the TLP coming out, and um, I'm particularly concerned about TLP programs within our state. I don't know if the other states are having issues with the age of young people being able to access the FISB funded TLP programs, but I'm a little, little disheartened. Um, I came to the conference this week feeling some kind of way just about services that are available for young people that we encounter on the street and that come through our basic center program. I feel stuck sometimes because we really don't have a lot of places to get those young people into from basic center. The 16, 17 year olds are the ones I'm specifically talking about. And our TLP programs will not service young people under the age of 18. I recently found out our maternity group home also will not service young people under 18. What do we do? I feel like my hands are tied and, and I'm somewhat desperate right now. All right, Cindy, very good question. So I'll address the second part of your question first. Our transitional living program, by statute, you can serve youth 16 to under the age of 22. And that's in our Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. So yes, you can serve youth 16 up to the age of 22 through your transitional living program. In addition to that, you asked about the transitional living program funding opportunity announcement. So with that, it's TLPs are five year funding. And so we have three years where we do put out a funding opportunity announcement. And the last one we put out was fiscal year 2014. So then there's a two year off cycle to ensure that we have enough funding to make sure we can continue to fund the additional, the TLP fund, the TLP grants that we currently have. So the next funding opportunity announcement will not come out until FY 2017. So I hope that answers your question. It did answer my question and I get it that they can take kids 16, 17, but they're not. So, and, and again, I don't know whether that's some policy within that agency, or it's an insurance issue, or what, but I'm being told that they will not take a 16, and they have not taken a 16 or a 17 year old. So what do we do? So what I can do is right after this session, you and I can get together and we can work through this. Because again, 16 years, 16 year olds can't be served through a transition living. My name is Katie, I'm with Catholic Charities in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I'm just wondering if anyone's working on the assessment forms in Spanish or HMIS data. So the assessment or the RHY, the Rotary and Homeless Youth uh, Data Standards. So I, I guess my question, I, I'll, I'll send a question back to you. Um, in terms of prior to the integration, how did you work with your um, Spanish speaking or other language speaking individuals? So because the, the amount of data entry was um, much less, we didn't have to gather as much data information <coughs> in that initial assessment as we do now, and so it was, it was much easier just to, to know, you know in, in a traditional assessment that we would do, it, it was much easier to answer those questions accurately, but now because there is more data required, and it goes into greater detail, some of our folks are a good big number, and so we're working with the parents on gathering some of that data. Um, so if, if the parents speak only Spanish, or in some cases, parents don't speak only Spanish also, it's just a much greater quantity of data to collect, and so it would be a lot easier to collect more accurate data if we could engage with them in Spanish through those forms. Okay, something that you said gave me pause because you're saying you're collecting more data. And it shouldn't be more data except for the universal elements um, as we made the transition to integrate RIMES with HMAS. So it should still be all of your runaway homeless youth, data elements that you've been collecting before, aside from the universal elements. So it shouldn't significant, have significantly increased in terms of data collection. So I, I, I say that because I'm asking you, have you seen a significant amount of questions being asked 
previous to what you were in the class. So, I see Karen furiously writing because that should not be the case at the local level. It should be your rhymeless data elements that you were collecting in the past, and on top of that, some universal elements. I, I can't remember how many off the top of my head, but I don't know if Michelle knows that. Well, and I also wanted to ask you a question because you, you specifically said HMIS data collection forms. So, our, and it, HUD has put up templates. Now, we do not have prescribed like HUD forms. You have to use this form. We, we leave some discretion in the community, but we have put up templates um, of data collection forms, like data collection at entry and exit. I believe that they are up in Spanish, but I will, that's what I was making a note to myself. Okay, and then that could be, if, if they're not using the HUD forms or if they took the HUD forms and then, you know, um, expanded on them to make them their statewide forms, which many folks do, um, it may just be a local issue where we need to make sure that, they, you know, they're, they're also um, producing the forms in Spanish as well. So, I just want to be clear, when we did the mapping of uh, Mia Rimas to HMIS, Unless you're talking about an SOP program, the data elements are almost exactly the same as they were in Neorimus. That, like the destination and exit had a few different answers between HUD and, and Neorimus, but we're, the, the amount of questions you're um, having to collect are the same, is the same amount, except for SOP. Um, across the board. So I know it feels like it's more somehow to you, but count them. It's not. So if you have a lot of extra stuff, it might be your community or your state asking that then. And, and it would be worth saying to them, do I have to collect this? So I'd also encourage you to attend the follow-up session to this tomorrow, which is from 1045 to 1215. And if you have the opportunity to sign up for one of those 15-minute consultation sessions, to please do that as well. Hi, I'm Mark Kiner, I'm a program manager at the Youth Work Center. As Mark and I, I oversee this transitional idea of return to group home. We've done a lot of work on coordinated assessment with HUD, and it's nice to see HUD representation here today. And I haven't heard any discussion from RHY with regards to how do we handle the situations where best practices in HUD don't work, best practices in RHMI. And how do we, um, how do we, how do we figure out when we're supposed to serve the client under RHY and meet their needs versus we have a separate funding that might also be implicated by HUD. So Mark, I will say that um, that's a very good question. That's something that we're focusing on in terms of looking at what are some of the issues that we're seeing in the field. Um, since this is fairly recent in terms of the coordinated entry, we're getting input, input and feedback from the field in terms of what are some of the issues they're seeing. I know that um, based on some of the information that I've heard, it's the whole assessment piece um, as part of the coordinated entry is not um, addressing or collecting information on youth vulnerability. And so that is something we've recently learned. So we're working to have conversations within um, BISB as well as with HUD in terms of looking to put out additional guidance related to that. So if there are any other concerns that you have, I would encourage you to put it on your evaluation form so when RITAC gets it, we can get that information as well to address any other issues that you are experiencing at the local level related to coordinated entry. And, and as part of this whole larger process of working our way into the, completely into the continuums of care, um, one of the things we need to do is to align those uh, HUD-related HUD requirements and BISB-related requirements uh, more completely. And one example would be um, how TLPs are considered, whether they're considered temporary housing or permanent housing. I've heard a number of folks uh, say that they felt a little bit caught in the middle because they were getting the, the, um, the, the way TLP was being treated um, and the way that uh, then affected their continuum of care 
is you know, performance scores, and we have been working on, on, on that to harmonize those so that uh, so that CC, so the world the Ryan grantees are allowed to do their work the way that they're supposed to without uh, the, the CSUs um, paying a penalty for it, but not only that, but so everyone is actually thinking the same. So I, I think we've, we'll take one more question. I know we've, we've gone over time, so I apologize. Um, but we'll go ahead and take one more question. Uh, Robert Brewer, uh, Harris County Protective Services for Children and Adults, Houston, Texas. Uh, we know by all of our families that we are collecting information for input into the HMIS database. We've had some families, when they hear that, refuse to provide information. Uh, because they don't want it, their use information in a database, but they still want services. And we're concerned, can we still use federal funds then to provide those services, or do we have to find some other funding source to provide the services that the families are going to be using? Yeah, I mean, this is something I, I'd like their, um, just be colleagues to back, <laughs> back me up on, but, but, but uh, you yeah. You can't, if you can't put them in the data system, then you can't report them. If you can't report them, then you're, then you're out of compliance with the requirements of the grant. So I think you have to be able to, to report them. doesn't mean you have to share the information with anyone else, but it does mean you have to be able to track your own people, right? Uh, in order, for one thing, just in order to serve them, right? but uh, also so that you meet the reporting requirements. Did you all? So I just wanted to um, repeat a couple of announcements that we made earlier. Um, so again, for the California grantees, there will be a discussion related to California licensing tomorrow in room one from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 um, a.m. In addition to that, I just also want to reiterate that we have the um, RIMAS data upload session tomorrow. The change was, it was originally slated for room 15. It will now be in this room to make sure we can accommodate everyone for that training session. And then finally, we do have a follow-up session from this general session tomorrow from uh, 1045 to 1245. Again, the change is from room 15 to this, this room. So I just want to say thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. We appreciate you and all the hard work that you're doing.